Two questions haunt every life, writes Andy Crouch. The first, what are we meant to be? The second, why are we so far from what we're meant to be? Hello and welcome to Restoring the Soul, a podcast dedicated to helping you close the gap from what you're meant to be and what keeps you from being all that. I'm your producer, Brian Beatty. Thank you for listening. And Happy New Year. We hope that 2021 is off to a great start for you. Thankful that you've chosen to start the year off with us and hoping that Restoring the Soul can become a regular part of your weekly podcast diet. Now, don't forget, we've got 160 other episodes from our archives featuring great conversations about life, love, and the pursuit of a whole heart. Some guests that have joined us range from John Eldridge, Lisa Turkhurst, Ian Morgan Cron, and Kurt Thompson. There's definitely something for everyone. And if you'd like to know more about Michael John Cusick, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. On today's podcast, Michael will continue and conclude his thoughts on a series of podcasts we have on understanding the soul. A quick summary of the six points shared last week shows us that our souls are created for union with God. Our souls are created for life and love, joy and delight. Our souls are designed with a particular rhythm. They're created for connection. Our souls can be broken, and you can forfeit your soul. It's definitely worth downloading and listening if you're interested in grasping the foundations of why we have a soul and why it's important to care for your soul. Now today we'll learn three consequences from not understanding the soul, and that the soul is created for union with God, for communion, for intimacy, for one in the other. So without any further delay, here's your host, Michael John Cusick. What is the soul of a person made in the image of God? We talk so much about the soul, soul music, soul food. That person has soul, soul survivor. I think that's a different spelling and different meaning, but we talk a lot about it, but what is it? I want to read some scriptures and just make reference to just a handful that came to my mind, and there's dozens more in scripture. Deuteronomy 6, five: love the Lord your God with all of your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Of course, in Matthew 22, the Pharisees asked Jesus, uh, what's the most important command? And Jesus uh, doesn't hesitate saying, love the Lord your God with all of your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And there's a second like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Psalm 42, my soul pants like a deer panting for water. Five or six verses later in Psalm 42, the psalmist says, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? A very interesting phrase that in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 is turned three different times. There seems to be a conversation that the writer is having with his own soul, which is just a fascinating concept. Proverbs chapter 13, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You've probably heard that. The second part of it says, a longing fulfilled is sweet to the soul. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 3, our soul will delight in the richest of fare. And then, of course, Psalm 23, 3, for which the Restoring the Soul ministry is named. He restores my soul and guides me in paths of righteousness. Did you know that God has a soul? By the way, I was reading Isaiah. I'm in Isaiah for the first part of this year. And in chapter 1, verse 14, God says, My soul hates your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They are weary to me. And we should ponder that. What does it mean that God has a soul? Is that God the Father? Is it is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Spirit? I would say yes. Um, and then think of the passage in the Gospels and Jesus in Gethsemane. And he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow in that night of agony. So God has a soul. And we're made in his image. And we have a soul. I've been really looking forward to reading this quote from one of my favorite authors, Ronald Rollheiser. He wrote a book called The Holy Longing, and with all the assumption 
and misunderstanding about what the soul is, he begins by asking that question. And I'll read this quote. What is a soul? It would be interesting to record impressions of what comes to mind spontaneously when one hears the word soul. For many of us, I suspect the word, to the extent that it conjures up anything at all, produces an image, a very vague one, of some white, semi-invisible spiritual tissue paper that floats deep inside of us and which takes on stains when we sin, and that will separate from the body at the moment of death. What is wrong with that conception, though, is that it separates the soul too much from the core of our persons, from our conscious identity. Our soul, writes Rollheiser, is not something that we have, it is more something we are. It is the very life pulse within us, that which names us alive. I love that quote from Ron Rollheiser. Our soul is not something we have, it's something that we are. You know, in Greek, the word for soul that's most commonly used in the New Testament is suke. It's where we get the word psychology, and that has to do with the mind, the emotions, and the will. In the Old Testament, the word most used for soul is the word nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H, and it's the breath of God. When God breathed life into Adam, he was giving him a soul. He was giving him a life pulse and naming him alive, and the soul was something that Adam was. Let me riff off of that quote and read a quote from Ruth Haley Barton in her extraordinary book, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership. Dr. Barton writes, When I refer to the soul, I'm not talking about some ill-defined, amorphous, soft-around-the-edges sort of thing. I'm talking about the part of you that is most real, the very essence of you that God knew before he brought you forth in physical form, the part that will exist after your body goes into the ground. This is the, quote, you that exists beyond any role you play, any job you perform, any relationship that seems to define you, or any notoriety or success you may have achieved. It's the part of you that longs for more of God than you have right now. If we were all sitting together in a circle, I would just sit in silence and ask what word or phrase pops up. So both of these quotes say so many different things. But they're essentially saying that our soul is the deepest, truest, most real part of who we are. It has to do with our identity. It has to do with how we are formed and that there is a way that things are that reflects our maker and our creator. What I'm interested in discussing during this brief episode is What has been the result for people of faith who follow Jesus, for Christians, this lack of understanding the soul has had really grave consequences for the church, which is the body of Christ, for our own spiritual lives. It certainly has had grave consequences in my own life, not understanding the soul. This idea of Psalm 42 My soul is panting. My soul is thirsty that God alone satisfies my soul. So I want to talk about three consequences that result from our not understanding and giving attention to this life that is interior and the deepest part of who we are. The first consequence is that the church has become largely rational and moral versus spiritual. Spiritual not being woo-woo, but spiritual having to do with of the spirit, that which is invisible in us, that part of us that is not body, that part of us which is not achievement, performance, 
but the part of us that just is. The part of us that in Jeremiah chapter 1 says, before I formed you and I knew you. The part of us that Psalm 139 refers to when David says, when I was woven together in the depths, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained in your book were written for me before one of them came to be. Now, that is not a verse, as I've always thought it was, about the day that I'm going to die is, and then fill in the date, like November 27th, uh, 2073. That's a verse about how deeply known we are and that God knew us before we were even created. That's the idea of the soul. And in the absence of understanding this present, embodied interiority to who we are, which defines us above and beyond anything in our external world and anything in the material world, without having that understanding, we simply try to understand God rationally. And this is where so many people that I talk to in my counseling office and in different ministry contexts say, I have read the Bible. I have memorized scripture. I listen to fill in the blank, all the best preachers and teachers and their podcasts. And I went to this church and the person was an amazing teacher. Why is there something missing? Why has my life with Christ resulted in so little fruit and so little of the abundance and so little of this life to the full? And why does it seem like the thief that Jesus refers to in John 10 is just kind of stealing and killing in my life? Because uh, I'm not living the Christian life that seems to be everything that I was promised. And I believe that's because of this emphasis on a pure rationalism that results when we don't have an interiority and uh, a life that revolves around our inmost being that is in union with God. And in our last episode, we talked about these different facets of the soul. And the first point was that the soul was created for union with God, for communion, for intimacy. Jesus said in John that the Father is in me and I am in the Father and I am in you. It's that kind of union. Now, in addition to this rationalism with this overemphasis and this soul emphasis on propositional cognitive intellectual truth, there's also a consequence that my own life uh, gravely fell into as well, and that is moralism. Moralism is what Dallas Willard called sin management, that my, my faith and my experience with God is, is really as valid as my behavior is right, as my behavior aligns with the laws, the statutes, the commandments, and in particular, above those laws and statutes, my behavior aligns with my cultural Christian expectations. And so I'm going to try to follow the rules. I'm going to try to look good. It's the pharisaical idea of the outside of the cup is clean, but the inside is not so clean. That the inside of the tomb has rotting bones and the outside is whitewashed. It's a whitewashed tomb. And again, God created us for and longs for a soulish interior union where we are, as Paul said in Ephesians 3, that we would be rooted and established in love. A second grave consequence of not understanding the soul and not attending to the realities of the soul is that it's created a massive disconnect between what we profess in our creeds and our beliefs and what we experience. You may have heard me tell the story uh, of standing in church one day many, many years ago. It was even before I met Julianne and was married. And I was memorizing scripture and struggling with addictive behavior behind the scenes and in my private life, nobody knew publicly, and singing the song, As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you, O God. And the lyrics saying, You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. And I remember just going, Yeah, right. God alone is my heart's desire. When will that ever be true? There's a hundred things 
that feel more compelling and more real that I find myself pursuing than God. I don't think there's anybody, I remember thinking, who God alone is their heart's desire. And I remember memorizing the scripture, Whom have I in heaven but you, O Lord? My heart and my flesh may fail, but you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And memorizing that and thinking, yes, somewhere deep down inside that's true that God is the thing that I want the most. And remember Ruth Barton's definition, your soul is the part of you that longs for more of God than you have now. The part of you that can't stop longing for that. So this massive disconnect between what we profess and believe, but then what we actually experience, that's what's leading so many people to walk away from the church and from Christianity, and oftentimes they'll say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual and I love Jesus. But there's still this question mark, like, I know Jesus loves me and I'd like to live him, but I don't know how to connect this experience in my inner life of my addictions, my compulsions, my lack of feeling loved, my self-hatred, just the stuff that I struggle with, the way that I feel about Christians, all of the distress and discontent and brokenness, that's in one hand. And on the other hand is the set of beliefs and creeds and truths that we call scripture and the reality of God. And there's this massive disconnect. It's only when we come to a place of our poverty, our place of brokenness, our place of finally going, I've got no game. It's in that place. It's like the two beams on the cross, our horizontal reality and the vertical reality. That meeting place in the center of those beams is in the place of our own brokenness. And that gap that this podcast is all about helping people close that gap between who we are and what we were created to be and then all the stuff that keeps us from being that. So be encouraged that if you're listening about the soul or whether this is a new conversation to you in terms of understanding the soul or whether you've been around this for a while and reading about the soul, that as you go inward to where Jesus is, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that is where you will find God and where he will meet you in your brokenness. And in that connecting point of those two beams of the cross, Instead of a grave consequence of distance and a sense of disconnection from God, there's suddenly a sense of rest. There's suddenly a sense of presence. There's suddenly a sense of need. And there's a surrender of the striving and the performing and the trying so hard to get God to give us the key to experience the life with him that we want. The final grave consequence of losing this understanding of the soul and this tending to the soul is simply that we've lost the idea of friendship with God. We've lost the idea that the gospel is a treasure for which we would go and sell everything just to buy the field in which that treasure is buried. You know, I am in this very moment in a a really sweet place with Jesus. And I have been because I'm coming off of two weeks of really allowing my soul, my body, my mind, my emotions, uh, me having to crank up my willpower, uh, two weeks of Christmas break. And my soul is really refreshed. I've really been able to drink deeply, time with family, time off from work and ministry and reading and watching too much TV and eating good food. And there's something about this sweetness where it is so life-giving. There is so much life in this moment, in this series of days and weeks, and it makes me hungry to live a different way, to live in a way like the psalmist said in Psalm 62, my soul finds rest in God alone. And so by way of confession, I just want to say that um, I can teach this stuff But I'm preaching to myself because our lifelong, not struggle, 
But our lifelong goal is to learn to rest in this inward place. And then our life becomes overflow. As opposed to standing at the pump, pumping the well for water to come out. We live with a stillness. We live present to the presence of God within. And our broken heart is made whole over time as we walk with God, as we walk with Jesus. And that broken heart that's made whole can then begin to contain and hold love. I've often said that the the human heart is like a container that holds love. And to the degree that it's broken is the degree to which love will go in and then flow out. It was Charles Spurgeon who said that the reason why we need to keep going back to the living water faucet of Christ is that we leak. And I remember reading that as a young Christian and thinking that was a great quote, and it is. But we weren't created to leak. We were created to be whole and to be holy, to have the different parts of who we are integrated in a kind of oneness and unity so that as we bring our relative oneness and unity to others, to a spouse, to a friend, to our children, that we we pass on that wholeness. And as they become whole, then two can become one. And so, so many more episodes here that we can talk about. But this lost treasure, this lost sense of friendship, this lost sense of intimacy, this sense of the beloved apostle, the beloved disciple John at the Last Supper. I love the picture where Jesus has just washed their feet. They're sitting at the table, and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And one disciple says, ask him who? And John the Beloved who never describes himself as John. He just says the one that Jesus loved. In the King James, it says that John had his head upon Jesus' bosom, that John was there at the table after this foot washing, and he's leaning over against Jesus, and his head is on his chest. That reminds me of a child with their head upon the chest of a parent. It reminds me of lovers with a head upon a chest, listening to the heartbeat. This interiority, this internal emphasis out of the most real part of who we are, out of this part of us that longs for more of God than we have right now, that longs for more union, that longs to be known more deeply and to know love more deeply, the part of us that longs to know that love has us. That comes out of the part of a child that says, yes, I am loved, and so I can put my head on the chest here. When we understand the treasure of the gospel, not just in cognitive terms, but in relational terms, in emotional terms, and in terms of our interiority, this place of the soul, our inmost being, it's there that we can listen to the heartbeat of God. So thank you for listening to another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. What we're all about is helping couples and individuals get unstuck. You know how some people go to counseling or marriage therapy for months or even years and never really get anywhere? Our intensive programs help clients get unstuck in as little as two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com. Thank you.